Good morning, Harold Baptist Church. It's great to be together again with you as we conclude our series on the believers' battles. I trust that this series has been an encouragement to you and has been an equipping time for you as we walk through our day-to-day -day issues in following Jesus and, and the spiritual realities that we deal with on an ongoing basis. Well, I just remind you that next Sunday is Thanksgiving. We are really looking forward to, to that. We trust that you can join us at 10 o'clock at our service here in the building or online for our Thanksgiving service. We're really looking forward to a special time of, of worship and praise together uh, at that time. And of course, on Wednesday night at seven o'clock, we have our prayer time as well. And we'd invite you to join us online for that as we connect together, encourage each other and, and share a time of prayer uh, with one another. Well, as we begin this morning, I'd like to start with a verse from Psalm 115, verse one, which says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. This is not about us, this is all about him. Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we gather together this week one more time to praise God together, to hear from God together through his word, and to respond to God together. And listen, we do all of this together, not independently of each other, but together as a church family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we don't do this, we don't have these times to, to simply examine the Word of God, although we do need to study it, and we do and we will. And we study God's Word because this is how God reveals Himself to us. This is how He renews our mind and transforms our lives. This is what he, he, where He tells us uh, what He wants of us and from us and for us and all of those things. So yes, of course, we study His Word. But there are those today that want to just examine His Word for details. Uh, we're not here studying today so we can go away with a, 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 a new historical fact to share over dinner or to learn a, a cool word from an ancient language or to learn something about a, the culture in a faraway place. That's not what this is for. We are here not simply to examine the word, but according to Hebrews 4 verse 12, this double-edged sword examines us. We are here to encounter God in his word by his spirit and have his word examine us and bring our hearts and the reality of our lives to the surface that, that things might be dealt with as we continue to walk with God and move forward together. And so that is my prayer as we meet together this morning. And I'm praying that we will simply lay our hearts, our lives open before the Lord and ask him to examine us, even as we look into his word. And that together we would hear from him that we would be different as a result. So let's begin by praying together. Father, this morning I echo the words of, of Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Search us, O God. And know my heart. And know our hearts. But try me, try us. And know my thoughts, know our thoughts. Father, see if there be any grievous way in me. See if there is any grievous way in us. And lead me, lead us in the way everlasting. Father, honor your name, we pray, as we come to your word. Speak to us by your spirit, plant your word deep in our lives, and bring the response, the growth, the change, and the interactions that will honor you the most as a result. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Well, have you asked yourself this question or asked somebody else out loud, or have you heard somebody ask you this question recently? What in the world is going on? What in the world is going on out there? I mean, we, it seems like every day there's something crazy going on that, that catches our attention again in a fresh way, and we say, what is happening? 
from COVID to conflict everywhere on every level, fires and storms, economic and social uh, uh, concerns, uh, political, a political zoo really is the best way to describe it. It's just incredible what's going on. And in these chaotic times, we seem to, to be more divided than ever in this world, in this world, in this country, and even in churches, even in churches. Some people during these times are, are lonely. Some are angry. Others are scared. Most of us, if not all of us, are confused. Well, in these times, it's easy for us to focus on me, focus on my desires, my ideas, my priorities, but that just drags us down and divides us further. So back to our question, what in the world is going on? Well, when we look at nations and leaders and the pandemic and economics, I gotta tell you, I don't know what's going on. And neither do you, and neither does anyone else out there. Only God knows what's going on. But we do know this, God is at work. He is doing something for his purposes and according to his plan. So we have to trust that. But Romans chapter 11, these verses that we read a few moments ago, uh, they, they reflect on, on God's work in history and continue right up to today. His work in Israel and through Israel, uh, in, in Gentiles and through Gentiles. His work across this world from every people group to rescue, redeem, and unite a people for his name and for his glory. And so we meet together today as a church family around God's word. We meet together in his name as his people for his praise and for his purposes. And sometimes when we do and we come together as a church family for all of these good, proper reasons, sometimes it, it doesn't go as smoothly as you might think it would. All of us, all of us battle every day with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, then we finally, having done that all week, we finally get the chance to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and then we start to interact and we find that the battle has somehow wormed its way in here, into the, the church, into the family of God. How does that happen? Well, the short answer is it happens because we're here. Me, you, her, him, us, we're here. And we bring the residual effects of our battles all week with the world, the flesh, and the devil and we bring all that, but more importantly, we come and we bring our own flesh, our own sin natures with us. I bring mine, you bring yours. She brings hers, he brings his, and together that can make for a real toxic soup if we're not careful and if we don't stay focused. And that can, that can just ignite and we end up with conflict in the church. That can happen. So, so the real reason why there can be conflict when the people of God get together it's because we're here. That's the simple reason. It's like that old bumper sticker that said, wherever I go, there I am. And that's the problem. When we're here, we're here. And so we bring this stuff with us. Well, the question today is how can we guard against this? As we battle the world, the flesh, and the devil on our own and, and together, and then we come, how can we handle conflict with each other as we interact as brothers and sisters in Christ? so that the battle does not end up raging inside the church instead of just out there? Well, I think the answer is given to us here in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, which we just read. We need to focus on and live for the glory of God, the God who's in control of all things, the God whose ways we cannot figure out, we do not understand, the God who owes us nothing, including he does not owe us an explanation for what he's doing. We simply owe him our praise. We need to give him glory. We need to live that way and focus on the glory of God. And living for God's glory together means, means this. As we come to the end of chapter 11, naturally, we stumble into the beginning of chapter 12. And chapter 12 of Romans, a very familiar passage we've looked at many times, says this. 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, based on all that he has been talking about now, of God's work in the world to rescue, redeem, and unite a people for his name from amongst sinful humanity, a bunch of rebels, I urge you, brothers, I appeal to you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We are to be a living sacrifice to this God. As we focus on his glory, as we live for his glory, every day, wanting nothing more than to simply be a, an act of worship to God, to bring him honor. Well, as he goes through now, this is a turn in this letter to the Romans. The last quarter of the letter, the last number of chapters here, are going to be dealing with uh, the battles that we face. In chapter 12, verse 2, we read this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's the battle with the world. Chapter 13, verse 14 says, Let us put on, then, um, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision to, for the flesh to gratify its desires. There's the battle with the flesh. Chapter 16, verse 20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. There's the battle with the devil. And so all through this section now, talking about being a living sacrifice, we have these spiritual battles represented and mentioned here, but flowing through it all is this idea of our connections as a church. How do we live together as the people of God? How do we interact in a way that prevents battles from erupting amongst us and keeps us on track together, heading in the right direction to bring him glory. Well, I'll give you a quick summary. Chapter 12 goes on to then talk about, after verse 2, he begins to talk about what it means to be a living sacrifice in how we serve, how we serve each other and how we serve with each other in the church. That we serve with humility and love and energy, that the gifts we've got, it's all about Jesus, it's not about me, we serve sacrificially, how we live as a living sacrifice while we serve in the church. He then goes on in the second half of chapter 12 to talk about uh, what it means to be living sacrifice as we face persecution uh, from the world around us. He says we simply care for each other and carry on doing good. We trust the Lord. We don't go to the powers that be to somehow save us and rescue us and stop the mean people and tell them to leave us alone because God seems to be leaving us to their, to their hands right now. No. We don't demand our rights or assert ourselves. We care for one another. We care for those in need. We carry on doing good, and we trust God with it all. I'm a living sacrifice. We are living sacrifices. As we serve in the church, as we face persecution. Chapter 13 talks about being a living sacrifice as we submit to the authorities. He then moves in the second half of that chapter to talk about how we... Um, carry on as a living sacrifice as we battle the flesh. Look at chapter 13 of Romans, verse 11. Besides this, you know that the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The return of Jesus is so much closer now than when we first started following him. It's closer now than it was this time last week. It's time to wake up, shed the works of darkness, fight the flesh, and walk in the light, walk in the righteousness of Jesus. Look down at verse um, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So again, how am I a living sacrifice in how we serve in the church as we face persecution? how we submit to authorities, and how we battle the flesh. Then that leads us to chapter 14. In chapter 14, verse 1 says this, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. As for the one who is weak in faith, relate to them, welcome them in, love them, welcome them in, but, but to, to teach them the word, to walk with the Lord with them, not to fight over opinions and to get them on your side and to get them thinking the way you do about every situation. No, it's not about making them more like us. It's about walking together to become more like Jesus. That's the point. And so we look at the one who's weak in faith and we welcome them in to be encouraged and strengthened as we go forward together. Now look at some of what was going on in, in the church at the time. One person, verse 2, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. 
Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. People were fighting in the church. Can you believe this? Over food. Over who's a vegetarian and who eats meat. Well, I don't think you should. Well, it, 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 conflict in the church over that? Now, I, I love vegetables and fruit, uh, but I got to tell you, it's no mystery, I don't think, to any of you that I have made peace a long time ago with the fact that I happen to be a carnivore. Uh, I love those burger places where you get those huge burgers that are all stacked up and the first condiment that they list on the menu is more meat, a different kind of meat on top of the meat that's there. Sign me up. I love that kind of thing. If you're a vegetarian, God bless you. That's great. Eat, eat your fruit and vegetables. Fantastic. That's, that's excellent. I got no problem with you. Why would we fight over that? Besides, I got a few extra vegetables you can have and you slide your meat over this way, we're gonna get along fine, right? Can you imagine the church in Rome fighting over food, over meat versus just vegetables? Incredible, but that's what was going on. Look again at verse five and six. One person esteems one day as better than another while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Here's the whole point. They're fighting now again against about days. Well, I think on Sunday, I should go to church and then do absolutely nothing. Really? Because I think on Sunday, I should go to church, worship God together with my church family, and then I've got the day to relax and do whatever relaxes me and, and do spend however I think. Some Christians think that we shouldn't celebrate Christmas because of its date and because of some of the pagan roots involved with some of the traditions. Well, others say, are you kidding? Of course we're celebrating Christmas. What a great time to focus on what God has done in sending his son for us. The people are fighting back then over a particular day and who's honoring a day and then how they're going to do that, as well as how they eat. It's just incredible that this is what they're doing. Can you believe that? I can. You know, it's sad to say, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to broach a couple of subjects here and it, it just needs to be done. Incredible in church circles today that people are arguing and fighting over wearing masks or whether we should sing or not. Well, why does that church get to do that and we don't? Or why are they doing that? Because we aren't. Look at us. Are you kidding? Who would have imagined a year ago? that followers of Jesus would be arguing about these kinds of things. We would have laughed and said, no, that would never happen. We look at food and we look at a special day and all that kind of thing. We think, oh, they were crazy to fight about that. What would they say about what we're doing? I mean, that's just, just, it's us and we bring ourselves to the picture and that can become a problem. So look at verse seven. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Look at verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This is huge. If we're going to live for the glory of God, we need to be a living sacrifice in the church, in the cultures we face persecution, uh, as we deal with authorities on the different issues going on in our world, as we battle the flesh, as we walk together with an eye to the weaker brother to encourage him and strengthen him, not to beat him up and fight with him about things. The bottom line is, you will give an account of yourself to God, as will I. So I'd like to move from, uh, we, we're talking about living for God's glory, but let's zoom in here on two statements that begin with the words, so then. Romans 4 verse 12 says, so then. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. I will account to God for me. You will account to God for you. To God. We will answer to God for our decisions, our choices, our conduct, our thoughts, our words, our attitudes, the, the decisions we made, and the way we interacted with those around us. We'll answer to God for that. So we need to focus on that, on pleasing God, instead of not on what somebody else is or isn't doing or what some other group is or isn't doing and what, what are we doing, what are they doing. Hey, hey, hey. 
we need to walk in such a way that we're ready to give account of myself to God. Now, with that in mind, that I'll give an account to God for my actions and my attitudes and my heart, I just want to mention this. When it comes to giving an account, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. In a world where our culture now questions every form of authority, rebels against every form of authority, nobody's telling me what to do, and, and has made the national pastime second-guessing people in authority, I just want to remind us, we can't let that creep into the church. Friends, I tell you, you need to be praying. We need to be praying together for our pastors and deacons. We answer to God. We will give an account to God for the choices we make as we lead our church family forward. And believe me, we take that seriously. So pray for us as we seek to honor God, as we look to fulfill the responsibilities we've been given and maintain the ministries that have been entrusted to us, but to do so in a way that protects our church family, as well as protecting our community and maintaining our reputation and testimony and opportunity for ministry out there because we're caring for them, even in the way we conduct ministry now. These are, these are complicated days. It, like every day is a minefield, right? So be praying for us as we do that. We'll give an account to God for how we lead here. And, and each of us, brothers and sisters, each of us will give an account to God for our choices and decisions. So I need to be a living sacrifice, sacrificing my flesh, my sinful nature, sacrificing that for, for God as an act of worship. Look at verse 19. Uh, well, let's go back to verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Verse 15. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. But what you eat, do not destroy for the one, the one for whom Christ died. Verse 19. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. I need to be a living sacrifice of myself to God because I will give an account for how I live. But I also need to be a living, make a living sacrifice of myself to God for others, for others. Inconvenience doesn't matter. Preference doesn't matter. Th those are sacrificed and they're dead on the altar, just like I'm there as a living sacrifice. It's not about that. I'm willing to make a sacrifice of myself to God. Uh, for others. Why? Look at verse 20. Do not, for the sake of food, think about this, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Here's what he's saying. Why would we take any of these kind of disputable things, these, these matters on which there's so many different opinions, why would we go ahead knowingly trip up, make this an issue, my preference and so on, make that an issue and trip up our brother or sister in Christ, cause distraction and division in the body? Why would we do that? Why? Look at verse 20. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. One old pastor used to say uh, to his people regularly, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So let's just leave the dirty work to him. Let's not get in on that ourselves. Satan, as we saw last week, is out to distract God's people, divide God's people, and destroy God's work in, among, and through God's people. Let's not participate in that because somebody's got a different idea than me. Let's carry on and go forward as living sacrifices to God of ourselves for others in order to bring glory to his name and unity to the body as we work for whatever will bring peace and mutual upbuilding. That takes us to chapter 15, uh, verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up, to build him up. We show ourselves to be maturing in Christ, to be growing, to be strengthening in our faith as mature believers as we sacrifice ourselves for others. That's huge. 
How many times in church history have believers pontificated and, and stood up and declared in their best church voice that I will be the bigger person. I am the stronger brother in this situation. And I will lead the way. If only you could be as mature as me. And as people do that, hold it. All we're really showing with that kind of attitude, all we're showing is that we're actually the weaker brother. We're the weaker brother. Friends, we're to sacrifice for each other. That's what scripture says. Well, as we look at all of this, this being a living sacrifice, living for the glory of God, in the way I serve in the church, in the way I face persecution in the community, in the way I deal with authorities, in the way I battle the flesh, and here as we interact with brothers and sisters in Christ, even on things about which we disagree, as we live for the glory of God and focus on the glory of God, I'm praying that God may grant us two things. Look at Romans 15, verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement, boy, could we use both of those today. <laughs> may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Get along, welcome each other based on this, this request here. May the God of endurance and encouragement give us that kind of harmony. Allow us to live as followers of Christ in that kind of harmony that together we'll be focused on praising him and bringing him glory that together there won't be tension and division amongst us, but we'll just be in this together so that we can come together to give him praise and honor and glory. And so that when we do, the watching world isn't distracted by all of this here in the church, but rather that they're focused on what are they doing? They're all together, all these strange people from different backgrounds. They got all these different ideas, but they're coming together. They love each other. They sacrifice for each other and they're doing it all to praise God. Who is this God they serve? Oh, may God give us that kind of harmony that leads to his glory in this community. And then secondly, look at verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. May God give you joy and peace as you believe that by the power of the Spirit, you may abound in hope. Oh, May God make us truly a unified, a unified uh, joyful, peaceful people of hope. Not people of, of conflict, but people of hope. People that can reach out to this community with help and with hope. With the gospel, as we point people to the Savior we love and serve together. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. Oh, we face battles every day. Yes, we do, but that's that's Okay. We're, we're in this together. Let's go. Let's go forward. Let's go forward together. Be encouraged because Jesus has overcome the world. Be encouraged because this sin, sinful nature, this flesh, Jesus has conquered sin and death. Be encouraged in your battle with the evil one. Why? Because God, Jesus has defeated Jesus, uh, Satan and he has condemned him and he will ultimately punish him forever. And on top of that, as we look at this fourth battle that sometimes arises, the battle with the other believers, brothers and sisters, this same Jesus that has conquered all of these other areas, he can and he will work in us to produce that kind of love for each other so that as living sacrifices, we live for his glory together. As Ephesians 4 says, brothers and sisters, let's not give the devil a foothold. Don't open the door a crack and let him get his foot in the door and worm his way in. Let's, let's walk with God with hearts for each other, hearts of sacrifice and love for one another. Let's walk together as we serve God as a living sacrifice individually, but as a living sacrifice collectively as a church family, even this week. I want to leave you with this short psalm, these three verses Psalm 133. David wrote this. It's a song of ascents. This was one of the songs they would sing as they were coming up the temple mount into the city for worship at the temple together. Behold how good and pleasant it is 
when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Oh, the place of God's blessing, friends. Imagine those holy moments. Imagine when Aaron was, was anointed as the priest. Imagine just the sense of the presence of God as the people were there. That's what we're talking about here. The place of God's blessing, life evermore, his presence with us. The, life, the place of God's blessing is not the place of the brightest ideas, the place with the boldest innovations or the biggest crowds. It is the place where brothers and sisters in Christ dwell together in unity as a people for his name. Oh, may that be true of us at Harrow Baptist Church and as Harrow Baptist Church. Let's pray for each other in the battles we all face day to day. Let's love each other in the temptation to battles that can sometimes arise in, in disagreements and differences of opinions as we come together as a church family. Let's be a living sacrifice of ourselves to God for others and watch him work as he makes his presence known here to bring glory to his name. Love you, praying for you, and just so glad to be a part of this church family that we can walk with the Lord together. What a great thing that is. Stay connected. Look after each other. May God bless you. We'll see you next week for Thanksgiving.